Hi, and welcome to Lights of the Roundtable. My name is Susanna, and I am so excited to start the mini series, mini proof series. We've been talking about it, uh, and we think it's necessary because a lot of folks, you know, just like everybody out there, we were lost at one point, and we've been able to connect the dots thanks to Emily Tan, who is the founder of the Quantum Stellar Initiative, and of course her right hand, uh, right right hand side, excuse me, of finances, Nick Bergon, because he has over thirty years of Wall Street professional uh, and and also whistleblower expertise in that sector, financial sector. So I'm very happy if you're joining us for the first time. I hope that you stick around because it is important about the financial changes that are going to affect you, not only you, but your life. And it's so exciting. So tokenization, tokenization, tokenizations. This is not the first time we've talked about it, Nick and, and Emily, and we're going to simplify it for the new audiences out there. So hopefully they'll be able to go to your community and explore in depth even more. So there goes my monologue. Hi, everybody. How are you? Thanks for having us. Dana, thanks for having us back. Pleasure to be here as always. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you, Emily. It's so great to have you. Uh, we're going through some thunders and lightning storms, typical of summer over here in Florida. So, um, all right, tokenizations, the buzzword. We've been talking about it for eight months. Things are just coming all Everybody's now, it's a buzzword. Everybody should know what is it and why it's so important. Okay, well, can I share my screen? Can you see that? Okay. Okay. So, you know, there's so much news on tokenization and there's so many people that don't even know what it is, basically. And they, they have no idea really of the changes that are happening around them. And, um, you know, we thought we would go to a basic understanding of what it is and then show some examples of um, real life examples of it being done really all over the world. But, you know, a basic definition that I tried to make it as simple as possible is uh, tokenization is the process of converting something into a digital token. And then you use it on a blockchain or, or, or another technology known as distributed ledger. So it's really, it's really digitizing something that's uh, either a real world asset or, or some other type of entity, like a, like a physical security or um, Commodity it could be virtually anything. Anything could basically be tokenized. And uh, the reason that it's it's really becoming prevalent is that it's an easier way to be able to transfer assets, move assets, send money from place to place, um, formal, formalize documents, and it's really fast, very very efficient, and uh, most importantly, it's very safe. No no tampering or shenanigans um, that can be really done in terms of once an item is tokenized. So, and I, I just put a few examples of tokenized items that we've seen as of recently of uh, currency, real estate, artwork, bonds, contracts. There's many, many more, but that's just a couple of, uh, couple of examples of recent tokenizations that we've seen. Stay with me. Oh. Okay. So, I wanted to, we need to go, we need to see the 40,000 foot view first, kind of, and, and, and I'm going to try to do it in a uh, Cliff Notes version, because we don't want to spend most of the call on this. But there are, there is a, you know, there are huge changes going on around the world. And uh, again, these are, these are changes that really are going to transform everything that we do in our lives um, at, at, on an everyday basis. And for literally centuries, you know, we have been controlled by a, by a power structure that is really, they have their hands in everything that we do on a daily basis. If we're doing financial transactions, if we're, you know, purchasing something in the supermarket, if, uh, you know, you're um, trying to uh, uh, accomplish something and putting out media and stuff, they, they're, they're basically there everywhere. And, you know, that's known, as, that's known as centralization, meaning that there's a central authority that's controlling everything. And this power structure has been in place for probably centuries, if not thousands of years. We call it, in terms of our group, the cabal. And now there's a new, there's a totally new financial system that's being put into place worldwide to really put an end to that power structure. And uh, it's been a really monumental effort. 
and it's taken many, many years, actually probably began decades ago, in order to finally take down this, this authoritarian power and basically make us free and sovereign people again. And, you know, the, the key to this, believe it or not, is, is really tokenization. And the reason, we'll go over the reasons as to why that's the case, but it eliminates the, the, the ability for them to control us because it takes away their tools that they've used for years and years and years in order to control us and enslave us and basically have us be compliant to whatever their, their uh, wishes were. It also stops illicit activity, criminal activity, and most importantly, well, let's say second importantly, it, it um, removes the intermediaries, the middle people that are literally taking money out of every single transaction that we do um, in our lives. Now, whether it be, as I said, going to the store, you got sales tax. You know, you, you, you want to drink water, you got to buy it. I mean, there's so many examples of it, but this, this, this method, methodology of tokenization is going to put an end to that. Okay, so I just wanted to briefly go over what really the, the, the main mechanisms of control that they've used are. And, and number one, obviously, is money. And everybody kind of knows that money, uh, money is a very big influence in people's actions, decisions. It really uh, it, it, it's the ultimate tool that people use to get other people to do what they want them to do. And most people don't know it, but, you know, we've been on a centralized banking system in, the, in terms of the world. In, since 1696 in the Bank of England. And what that means is that there's a central bank that's controlling monetary supply, monetary policy, uh, everything we do with regards to money. And it, it allowed them to control the, the supply of money and also to put out what we call fiat currency, which really is money that has no real value behind it, which is virtually every money in the world, including ours, from the Federal Reserve. So there's no intrinsic value there, and they can essentially print it at will. So, you know, in reality, they're pieces of paper, but you know, there's an implied backing or, or uh, uh, they call it the backing of the government, but in reality, there's no real value at all whatsoever to, uh, to the money. And that system basically facilitates a lot of criminal activity in terms of the stock market, commodities markets, um, and literally any type of market and banking activity has the ability to allow these people to to hide money, to send money to, uh, you know, accounts in the Virgin Islands, launder money. I mean, there's a multitude of crimes that come out of this system, in addition to them creating wealth for themselves through, as you see, like uh, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, through the stock market. They've created enormous wealth for them at our uh, at our expense. So really, tokenization eliminates this because the technology is known as blockchain, and the three main tenets of the blockchain technology is that it's immutable, meaning nothing can be changed on it once it's put on the blockchain. It's transparent, so you can actually track all transactions if necessary. Uh, doesn't mean that we won't have some anonymity, but it means that if, say, the government thinks their crime is being done, they can actually track anything. And then most importantly, it's decentralized, so no one authority controls. Um, decisions uh, made on the with regards to the blockchain um, it's known as a uh, as a node process but we'll talk about that another time but basically there's no one authority as is the case right now in, in particular in banking but also other industries as well so you know th this is the areas that 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 are used in terms of controls I mentioned financial markets literally that's probably the biggest of all in terms of um, criminal activity, let's call it. You know, just short selling, naked short selling alone, I did a piece on this, is over $100 trillion a year. And, you know, they're basically stealing money from us. It's, you know, when, when someone's making money, someone's losing money. It's us that's losing the money and them that's making the money. So that's the area that really, really has been prevalent in terms of, uh, being able to amass wealth, you know, manipulate things. And that goes for precious metals, currencies, all those markets. And they've, they've been fined so many times. You can see, read the news. These com companies have been fined dozens and dozens of times for, for 
you know, violating the laws and, and uh, manipulating things. And then they pay a fine of, you know, a few million dollars or a few hundred million dollars, which to them is the cost of business and they move along. So for them, it's definitely a profitable enterprise because the money they're laying out in terms of penalties versus the money they're taking in, this, they're not even comparable. They make a fortune of money uh, doing what they do. So, and then, you know, tokenization also in terms of us as a people, there's many benefits in terms of costs, there's convenience, it brings economic equality, it allows you to be involved with things that, you know, only the rich used to be involved with, and uh, new opportunities in terms of projects and things. There's many, many benefits to us in addition to ending the power structure that's in place right now. And the reason we're really doing this call is because many of these people, as Susanna said, don't believe it. That any, the famous words that we constantly quote in the QSI lights of the round table is that nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. I don't see anything happening. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. There's so much happening that we could barely keep track of all the things that are happening. And, and they're really positive and substantial things that are, that are happening. So we decided that this call would be to uh, show some proofs in terms of what is, is happening out there to support the fact that we're talking about tokenization becoming really, as I put in the title, the wave of the uh, future. So we'll, we'll take a quick look first at traditional investments. That's my area, Susanna said. I worked on Wall Street for 30 years. Through that time, I learned all the, let's call them tricks of the trade and all the uh, shenanigans that they utilize that people aren't aware of in order to be able to uh, you know, to be able to make a fortune of money. And I did a call actually with Emily specifically on that many, a couple of years ago. That was how we first got together. But this, this is an area you got to look at really first and foremost, because most people have investments that they plan on retiring on and, uh, you know, building a nest egg, funding future educational needs. So that's an area that a lot of people's net worth is, uh, is tied up into. So. So I'm, I'm sure you people know this by now. Uh, investment firms make their money by basically selling products and charging people fees and letting, telling them that basically they're not intelligent enough to handle their own money. So we can handle it for you for um, a, a, a fee. And, you know, manipulating markets, interest. I mean, interest is insane. You look at credit cards, 21% a year interest. Uh, you know, these are these are all, and interest was actually illegal, by the way, and immoral centuries ago. But they're doing it now, obviously. So they make money from a from a multitude of different ways, and actually, tokenization, believe it or not, destroys their businesses because what it does is it allows people to complete their transactions directly, to bank directly, to invest directly. They don't need a middleman, they don't need advisors, they don't need bankers. Really nothing will be necessary uh, in the future when tokenization becomes the main, you know, the mainstream norm. So this is really a destructive process that's, that's happening through their business. But if you look at the headlines, you see that some of the biggest firms, and, and, and I put these headlines here and what people should do because we can't post every article is that you can look these titles up and you'll find the article that corresponds to it so you can read more uh, in depth and i encourage that we always all of us encourage to do your own research so you can pick these titles and then you can look them up and you'll find what they're talking about but just to look at some headlines you can see the tokenization of real world assets is up to four it's going up to four trillion dollars and it's going to be actually probably 16 trillion dollars over the next of say 10 years you have blackrock which is one of the biggest financial firms if not the biggest in the whole entire world tokenizing uh, funds and again tokenization it minimizes and destroys the business so it's kind of a uh, enigma for people that don't understand what's happening templeton launched a, a uh, tokenized mutual fund franklin templeton did a uh, did a money market fund got a billion dollars in treasury notes. So these are all examples, and you can all see them in the news that tokenization's already begun, and it's begun in a very, very big way. And it's not only here, it's happening really, literally worldwide with some of the most major financial institutions in the entire world. So for those that think that nothing's happening, 
These are only a few headlines. If you need another few hundred, just send me a direct message. I'll be happy to supply you with uh, whatever else you might need in order to convince you that things are really happening. Okay, so now, now we're looking at metals and commodities because that's another area that people have significant money into. And, you know, most people do it through the function of physical metals and commodities. But, you know, the, the big boys, so to speak, they use derivatives, they use uh, futures contracts and all kinds of things in order to take positions in these, uh, in these areas. But that's also getting tokenized as well because it's going to, number one, eliminate, again, eliminate the middleman, most important, stop them from making money. And also it allows you to use these, these assets to be able to back what we know to be coming, which is asset-backed currencies, and that's going to be worldwide. So by tokenizing things, that you can do, it's an easy way of actually showing ownership and, and backing, collateralizing currencies all over the world. And also, you know, in terms of commerce, imagine if you, you know, you want to do a deal of uh, 100 tons of steel from China to uh, America, and instead of having to ship 100 tons of steel, basically you sell, you sell them a token which shows that they own 100 tons of steel. You make the deal right then and there, probably takes a minute, and then, you know, you've made your deal, and then you follow up correspondingly with the delivery. But it, it's going to facilitate a whole new way of commerce, really, around the entire world. So here's just a few examples. And again, look these titles up in, on the internet, and you'll find the corresponding articles. You have tokenized gold, billion dollars in market cap. You have another token, Pax Gold. Um, you have uh, commentary, the new frontier, investing in tokenized precious metals. Silver tokens, China's doing the yuan, their, their own money, BRICS currencies, gold back currencies, oil, which I actually didn't know. I didn't see that there was actually a tokenized oil, but I'm not surprised. And then my favorite, which is Zimbabwe's gold back currency, which is not totally gold back, but that's a separate story. But this, these are clear examples of, <laughs> these are clear examples of basically tokenization in, in the metals and commodities markets as well. And at the bottom, I put this, and if you remember anything from this, my part of the presentation is that everything will be tokenized, everything. Everything you're involved with, everything in your life is going to be tokenized. And uh, it's going to be a, a, literally a whole new world. So we're trying to educate people before that happens so they don't end up scrambling when the time comes that all of a sudden these changes come upon them and they're like, what do I do, what do I do? We spend all our hours of pretty much every day trying to do this at QSI, at Lights of the Round Table, in order to uh, try to prepare people and let them know the truth about what's happening. Okay, so I, I want to really close my portion of this, and, and I have one more slide after this, but really the closing of this explanation on tokenization. And again, another, another highlight that you should remember because it is 100% true, that tokenization is inevitable and essential. Okay, and I've listed the reasons here. That and, that and this is really what will dismantle the power structure, give us the power over our own destinies, and uh, really allow the, uh, the, the population to stop being treated as uh, possessions and slaves, and really to be sovereign uh, citizens. So, you have the reasons are decentralize the money system, as I mentioned, the Federal Reserve is bye-bye, and as well as the other central banks in the world. It eliminates illicit activities because you can trace everything, stops the devaluation of currency, which is a big topic that we talked about on QSI and Lights, because our country and other Western countries have really decimated some other, other countries around the world by manipulating their currency and destroying their economies and their peoples. It's a, it's, a dev, it's, it's a travesty what we've done in using that as a weapon, the evaluation of currency, and that's going to stop, which is, you know, I can't even stress how monumental that is. It, it's going to allow currency to be backed by real assets, as I mentioned, with real value, not, you know, monopoly money that you can print at any given moment in time and as much of it as you want. That's not going to be the case anymore going to have to have real assets that are backing currencies, and that will be for the whole entire world. 
so that nobody will be able to manipulate their currencies anymore because there'll be a real value that you can see and calculate. So you can't just drive something to basically almost zero because there's nothing behind it. The asset value itself will cause smart investors to step in when they see a discount to the real asset to be able to capitalize and then make money. It stops manipulation of all financial markets, which is one of my favorites, because I was in that, as I said, that business for three decades. It allows fast and easy money transfers and transactions, removes the middleman from all industries. And Emily and I and, and Suzanne have talked about the fact that just that alone, when that this occurs, it's going to remove 66.6% .6 of all the costs involved in every single thing you do. So when you buy an item that China made for a dollar and it comes here and it's on the shelf for $10, the only difference between the two are the people in the middle. So when you eliminate those people, uh, there'll still be a profit made, but it won't be a dollar to ten dollars. Maybe it'll be a dollar to a dollar fifty or something along those lines. So our our cost of living is going to plummet uh, in in the next several years as this is implemented because prices are going to go down dramatically and your money is going to go much farther than it does right now. Uh, so that's a really really important point, and then it it also allows and we won't get into this on this call but it allows simplification of contracts forms you won't have to go to lawyers you won't have to go to accountants you won't have to go to estate planners you know all these people that basically charge you again fees for doing the uh, preparing stuff that uh, a lot of it which is free anyway but you're not going to need that anymore you'll have standardization of many many contracts and things that we use in our lives every day and you won't need to go to anybody you'll be able to do it yourself and also allows the easy transfer of assets and ownership of assets from one place to another, literally, and it could be in seconds. And uh, and it's safe and secure, can't be tampered with. So these are all the real reasons that th there's no there is no question that tokenization and digitalization is going to be our world in the future, and our banking system is going to be based on that. And everything that we do in terms of our lives is going to be tokenized. So best to learn it now while you have the opportunity to do it. And while there are still opportunities at very low cost to be able to capitalize on that so that when the time comes, you can be prepared and not be scrambling, trying to figure out what you're going to do when, uh, when this really becomes mainstream. So I have one last slide. I'm going to mention very briefly that, and we won't go again into it this book, but Stellar is going to be the predominant blockchain of the new financial system for a plethora of reasons that we can't go into now otherwise this goal before I was wrong so um, this is the blockchain that they're going, that's going to be used and it, it's a given because they have everything established already for the infrastructure of consumer and business needs meaning investments purchasing uh, items commodities um, interest bearing uh, investments um, the passive income, I mean, anything you can think of essentially is already on the Stellar blockchain, whereas the other blockchains don't have any of that. So, you know, they, this is by far will be the predominant one that we'll probably be using uh, literally every day when we're doing stuff. It's already the one of the, the established leader in tokenization. Emily, well, you said they were number one now, so they used to be number two, but now they're number one in tokenization already. And they're going and they're going to be going gangbusters in the next several years it's really fast it's really really cheap to use it costs fractions of a penny to use think about when you wire money from a bank you know, it takes days and days which in which they use your money in between while you're waiting for it to get to the other side to make money it costs a whole bunch of money it's a whole process of filling out forms and everything else so imagine being able to move you know a million dollars from here to Japan in literally two seconds. I'd say that that's a little bit preferable to the uh, existing system right now. Um, very, very big is the ability to track and claw back stolen assets. Fraud is there's hundreds of billions of dollars of fraud every year in you know credit cards and bank accounts and uh, identity people stealing identities. All of that will be eliminated by by tokenization. And Stellar is the leader in smart contract technology, which 
I won't go into again deeply. It's really what we talked about in terms of tokenizing contracts, forms, agreements, every, any, everything, every agreement or every transaction who can actually be programmed into a smart contract. So again, it simplifies the process uh, a tremendous amount. And then they've been expanding all over the world. And uh, you can again, look up the Stellar blockchain and related news and you'll see all of the, uh, all of the inroads that they've made around the world. So I just put this on the bottom. Stellar is where the blockchain meets the real world, but they are going to be really, as we use our, our famous statement is, everything is coming into Stellar. So, and that's going to be the case. So it behooves you to learn about it now, again, uh, while you have the opportunity to do it, because when more and more people find out, the prices of, of, uh, of, Cryptocurrency on the on the blockchain itself are going to go up. The their currency, the XLM, which is the Stellar Lumen, is going to go up. So you have an opportunity really now on the ground floor to participate in a monumental change that's happening around the world. So and that's Exc the end of my second. Exciting times, and you know what? Um, let me piggyback on what you just said because even even if you go and research Stellar, even the director of uh, tokenization within Stellar. Uh, posted, I think, two weeks ago or something like that. Uh, tokenization is here to stay. So definitely it's coming from the big man himself. Uh, and I know that it's going to revolutionize the world. And one more thing I wanted to do, mention, and these are, for example, movie buffs out there, or if you're in marketing or in advertising, guess what Sony just did? Uh, Sony, this is an article that just came on July 12th. Sony um, is uh, securitized in security, is issuing a security token for Sony movie. And that movie is called Hero Island. So for the first time, even those who are working, uh, producing a film, or even you, if anybody can actually participate and take a token, and you know, you'll be able to, let me see, they say that uh, you can receive perks, and you'll be able to, um, it says, producers and supporters work together to create and nurture movies. So basically, you'll be rewarded as others. You know, you will get your little piece of the pie for the profit. So anyways, I find it very exciting. No more token, no, no, no more uh, Fandango or Ticketmaster? Imagine uh, but, that. But <laughs> No, but it just came out. So they're actually tokenizing the movie right. right now. So it is very exciting because you can you can see now how tokenization can actually work in many facets of ordinary lifestyle. So it's very exciting. Emily, you've been so quiet. Now it's your turn. Tell us, what are you going to enlighten us with? Well, you know, Nick does a fantastic job really explaining what tokenization is and how it's impacting, let's say, the greater world around us. Um, because, you know, like when he's talking, and he says this, like, securities or, um, you know, real world assets, we're literally talking about everything, everything that you can possibly imagine is coming into blockchain, and then it's going to get bridged over, moved over into the Stellar blockchain. And so what I want to do is basically share a bunch of slides. I have a couple more than seven, but they're going to go pretty quickly. And I'm going to hit you with article after article, proof after proof of some real world um examples of what's really going on behind the scenes so Perfect. let me do my share definitely hopefully you guys can see that yep yeah okay perfect so um, i do want to play a really quick video for you it's um just under one minute but this is mark yusko if you've never heard his name i know people who are following the scenes have but if you haven't he's the chief cio at the site he's the founder and the cio um, of Morgan Creek Capital Management. And he's been asked to be on many, many panels on various uh, blockchain conferences for several years now. And I love this tiny little clip, so I just wanna play it for you. Every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every bottle of fine wine, every collectible car, every piece of real estate, every private business, every everything, everything of value in the world will eventually be a token. And people were sniggering and, and like, yeah, whatever. And, and now, we know it's true, right? Y'all are, are proof, positive. The talent migration into this space that has recognized that this adoption of technology, this evolution, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution of technology that everything of value will be a token on a blockchain. 
not a coin, not a thing. It's literally a line item on a public ledger. Everything of value will be that. And every transaction of value will happen in digital assets. So, I mean, Nick just listed so many of them. And I think the best way to really wrap that up is every everything, right? <laughs> Literally everything that, that Nick's mentioned, everything that Mark's mentioned. And I'm going to, again, show you a whole bunch of examples. So not going to go into detail on this one. Nick covered a whole bunch of it. But just want you guys to see some numbers, right? So right now they're shooting for $16 trillion worth of real world assets coming into the blockchain or into the, the ecosystem by 2030. So we're talking really, really big numbers now. I want to move on to CBDCs because this has been such a hot topic for people. And truly, Susanna, you, Nick, I probably know better than almost anybody in the world that 99.9% .9 of the world does not know what CBDC is, what it really is. And they're putting out a whole bunch of false narratives, which I do want to go over as well at the end of this section. So before we get into that, let's talk about what is a CBDC then, right? So basic 101, CBDC stands for Central Bank of Digital Currency. But what does that actually mean? It means it's the digital form of a country's fiat money. But the thing is, this is actually minted or created by either the country's central bank or the treasury. And this is really important to know because a big distinguishing factor is you have another rival type of asset called a stablecoin. And a stablecoin is just a pegging. It is not a minting of any actual assets. So it says a stablecoin is one-to-one -one peg to a paper fiat. So let's say, for example, one-to-one -one pegging to a U.S. dollar. And if that U.S. dollar, which is worth absolutely nothing, and Nick has done a fantastic job on many, many calls explaining exactly why it's worth your toilet paper, well, if that goes down to zero, then your stable coin also goes down to zero, right? So that's a really big deal. But in the future, what's going to happen is because our CBDCs are actually backed by real-world assets, which is something that's going to be coming into the public, known as Bretton Woods 3, right? So through, through the rest of this year, we'll see more and more articles about that announcement. And then as we push into the next couple of years, I think everybody in the whole world, even people who don't want to know about Bretton Woods 3, will know about Bretton Woods 3. And when that happens, that's when the real game changer happens. And so the other one that I want to mention really quickly is just a traditional general cryptocurrency. Guys, these are not minted by a company. Sorry, these are not minted by the government, rather. These are minted by companies. They're minted by normal people. You and me can mint a cryptocurrency. And so when people talk about how there's a lot of fluctuation in the value, it's because cryptocurrencies don't have to have any actual asset backing behind them. But if you have a CBDC, it has to be backed by some kind of physical asset. And that's how you know they're going to be worth value in the future. So I'm going to go over the three kinds of CBDCs really quickly. You can really break it down into major types. One is for banks and institutions, and one is for everything else, right? Peer-to-peer -peer transfer, retail payments, buying your groceries, going to restaurants, buying your new you know, outfit. That kind of stuff is all the non-institutional CBDC. Then you have something called a hybridized CBDC, which isn't too popular right now, but I think may gain traction in the future because all it really is like your hybrid SUV or a hybrid car, is you're combining the two together. So in the future, because of something called programmable assets, which we'll get into later, you can actually program your CBDC to flow directly through, no matter if it's institutional or a retail coin. So I also want to highlight something that Nick went over in his section, and he really hammered the fact that CBDCs are decentralized. And guys, I really want to emphasize this. This cannot be understated whatsoever. When people talk about assets, usually cryptocurrencies, um, people who don't know what they're talking about, and they talk about CBDCs, everything's always on a centralized blockchain. And remember, guys, Nick told us centralization really means a controlling authority. So if you decentralize it, you remove the controlling authority. And that is a massive difference to understand because decentralization truly creates self-empowerment, it creates freedom around the world. And so that's something really to keep in mind. Um, I don't want to get into detail on it too much, but I do want to mention that, you know, when you have a central blockchain like Ethereum, that can lead to something that's called double spend attacks, which really means you don't really know if people have been spending the token or not. 
And so let's say two different people or even the same person twice can spend that asset. And that's, again, what causes a lot of fraud and manipulation. But on a decentralized blockchain, it puts a stop to that. So a lot of that corruption will go away instantly overnight. And the reason behind it is something called Stellar Consensus Protocol. Again, that's the reason why Nick was mentioning Stellar a second ago. It prevents a lot of the fraud like this. So um, I move on to the next slide. This is really just a, a quick slide. I want to show you that if you look over in this right hand corner in the blue, uh, sorry, in the red font, it says 134 countries um, are already going through the process of tokenization. And that represents 98% of global GDP. So guys, this is massive because now we're throwing you facts and figures that literally pretty much the entire world is on some version of um, you know, tokenizing their assets into CBDC, whether they are still in prepping mode or they're in beta testing mode or they fully actually launched an asset, right? Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's going forward in this direction. So I want to give you a quick example again of what it looks like when it actually becomes tokenized. I was in Japan recently, just a couple of weeks ago. And so keep in mind, guys, I wanted to test CBDCs. I did not exchange any US fiat for Japan yen fiat. So everything was done just on my phone. And what happened was I went over to the, all these, you know, these different merchants at the different cities, and I used my Apple Pay, which is connected to my Coinbase credit card or debit card rather, which I have set to use XLM as my value. So I, you know, I'm here in Japan, I'm going to the store and boom, tap to pay just like everywhere else in America that we've seen. So, you know, you, you like the, the transaction comes up, you hit boop, and all of a sudden the payment is done just like it were in America. But I did not have to go and exchange my US dollars for Japanese yen. And the bigger kicker is all of the stuff that I was doing for, for payments was done offline. And this is another massive difference between Stellar and everywhere else, because if you can do offline payments, then that means you can truly have this anywhere in the world, because we all know not everywhere in the world has stable and, um, and, and great internet speed. So if you can do it with, with offline uh, capabilities, that truly means anyone, anywhere can use this. 24 hours a day. Exactly. Yes. And talk about, and talk about the savings on those transaction fees. Just changing. Oh just changing yeah. from one. I, I tell you, wow. Cool. I'm glad. Are, that's like the worst. Right there. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then, you know, your normal, you got you, you got to switch over into your fiat. But then once you're over there, um, well, if you use fiat, that's one thing. But if you don't, they need to pay for the credit card yeah. processing, right? And those are mold, like many, many, many percentages. Whereas like what Nick said, this is a fraction of a penny. So it's really night and day, guys. So this picture, I know it's really busy. I'm not going to go over all of it. I just want everyone to see that there are a lot of big CBDC cross-border projects going all over the world. And if you do go to AtlanticCouncil.org and you see this, you can actually click individual buttons and see all of the different countries and the institutions that are involved. So all I've done really is pull over the major names for everyone to see. You've got the Biz, the Biz Innovation Hub, MAS, HKMA, all of these major banks like Bank of England, Federal Reserve, right? So this is a, a massive global um, movement, for lack of a better term, right? Mark Yusko said, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution. So we're all evolving with or without regulation. Industry is already leading the way. And they're pushing forward so that when time comes where regulation is actually pushed out the door, it means industry is already there. They've already done all the beta testing in the background. Everything is working seamlessly. So the power of programmable money. Now, I do want to spend a quick second on this because this is truly game changing, guys. So the two boxes that you see here, the top one is from IBM. The bottom one is from KPMG. I think everybody has heard of this company before. And so what programmable money really means is, let's say if you take normal fiat, or let's say if you take a normal credit card or a debit card, there's no programming behind it, right? You simply just exchange it and that's it. There's no conditions wrapped around that. And what programmable money means is you can actually create through blockchain all these different stipulations and the money can only be sent if stipulations are met. So what could that look like? If you look at the top bullet point here, Government stimuluses. Okay, so during COVID-19, we all received stimulus checks. But if you're like me, 
the check came in the mail, you had to worry about if it's going to get lost in the mail or stolen or, or something. And then when it actually came, then it's like, okay, well, all the banks are closed because COVID. So how am I going to cash the check? And then you had, if you're a business owner, you had the PPPs. But recently, we've been seeing a lot of beta testing for something called UBI, Universal Basic Income. Now, whether or not that comes in the future, the fact that people are testing, governments are testing, institutions are testing, should be a hint that maybe this is a big deal that we need to pay attention to. And how can they possibly roll this out universally, right? Because UBI is universal. It's not Texas basic income. It's not Florida basic income or New York. It's everywhere. So you need to be able to have this for people who are in Africa who maybe do not have access to a bank. And so this is one great way to program it and send it all over the world to even people who don't have bank. It's called the unbanked people. And so if you are, let's say, a company and you want to send out bonuses or incentives to your employees, let's say they are your sales team and they've hit their commission for the month and you want to give them some goodies, this is a great way to do it. If you are a parent and you want to give allowances to your kids, but you don't want to keep you know, reaching into your bank and swapping this and that, you can have all this programmed for your kids. It's nice and safe. Coupons, discounts, there's something called staking and yielding, which all that really means in normal everyday language is interest-bearing assets. So things like a certificate of deposit, that would have been a great example, except for nobody uses that anymore because it sucks. These versions are really great because the interest is actually quite high. So I'll just kind of end with, guys, programmable assets is massive because Nick has talked about how you can actually stop a lot of the corruption, right? The, the criminal activity, the fraud, the hijacking, the scammers, is because they are not tied to, you know, a, a fiat dollar or your debit card is not tied to KYC AML, know your customer anti-money laundering, but programmable money is, and they can put stipulations on, for instance, like if you're doing a transaction and it recognizes that you are not in control of your wallet or you are not in control of your assets, it'll actually block that transaction from happening in the future, guys. Right now, they're still doing beta testing on it. So it makes it super secure because it's going to be able to KYC you for every single transaction to make sure that no scammer will ever hack into your wallet and steal your funds. Now, I want to go over this in a little bit more detail because I, I know, you know, Suzanne and Nick, you guys will probably have a lot of feedback for this as well. But one of the big things that people don't understand about CBDCs is they're following the wrong people who just don't know what they're talking about. They are feeding people misinformation and disinformation narratives, and it's confusing everybody. So let's go ahead and take the time to set the narrative straight. You know, one of the big things that people always talk about is CBDCs are controlled by the government. So they have absolute control. It's like a dictatorship. They can turn off your wallet. They can take away your funds, your assets at any time. And one common example they use is that Canadian trucker rally. That was, you know, the, the protest. And so the government said, I don't like these, you know, number of protesters. We're going to cut off access to your bank account. And everybody freaked out. Well, guys, we have been mentioning this over and over again. On a decentralized ledger, you do not have control like that. Only on a centralized ledger, you have control. Decentralized, no control. And also in, in Stellar, there's something called self-custody, which means you control your wallet and nobody can hack into your wallet unless you give them permission to. So the, com the government cannot come and log into your wallet and take your accounts if you did not give them permission to. Do you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, right. I want to the fact that People are worried about, like what you said, that <clears throat> the government will control us and they'll shut off your account. They do that now and we don't have CBDCs, okay? Oh, that's so true. You're worried about that happening then, they do it now. The IRS goes into your account, takes the money out. They do all of that now. And when this tokenization happens and these the real, what we call CBDCs, but you know, really is sovereign currency or whatever you want to call it, they won't be able to do that because they're not going to be in control of it. So they can't touch you. So people that are using that argument about, oh my God, they're gonna control us, it's the mark of the beast, and they're gonna shut our accounts down if we don't comply. They do that now, okay? And they don't have any CBDCs. Correct. So that's a ridiculous argument to begin with. Yeah, I mean, that Canadian trucker rally was proof right, right. there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if we go on to the next bullet point, you know, again, guys, they say that the government or the company 
like WeChat or Alipay or Telegram, which are all social media platforms, and they're all in the process of integrating crypto onto their social media, if they cut you off, well, then what happens to all your money? You've just lost access to it. Again, guys, that's absolutely false. On a decentralized ledger, the government or the company not do that. They do not have the authorization nor the control mechanisms built in to even do something like that. And on top of that, even if they try to hack in, there's something called Overwatch. And Overwatch will be there in the background to help watch governments and companies and protect you from them trying to scam you. So this is the most beautiful system I've ever seen before because we have an Overwatch that'll get there and monitor a, a, a prior um, well, still now to, you know, to an extent these days, a corrupt system, right? So we're going to have overwatch to watch over the corruption because the corruption was proven to not be a good system is what I'm trying to say. So no privacy from Big Brother surveillance. Um, they also say there's no privacy on these public ledgers. Well, guys, again, when you have governance in place and it's built into the Stellar Network and you have something called Zelmo, which is under beta testing right now, it's not public information yet that will come out in about two years time, guys, so wink, wink. But when this stuff comes, it basically says that they are going to embed certain security protocols, like Zelmo is gonna be the hybridization of the Stellar blockchain with all of its security functionality, speed, et cetera, with the Monero blockchain. And Monero is where you get your anonymity. So let's say like with the public ledger as the example, right now today in Stellar, if you go into the ledger, and you look at, let's say, you know, that's definitely Nick's wallet. Well, you can see where Nick is moving his assets to, who he's paying, who he's getting money from. And, you know, Nick probably doesn't want that because that's going to be a security concern. So what they're going to do is they're going to put on that Monero layer on top of it. And so as it obfuscates, you know, this, they will no longer know it's Nick's wallet unless you just, you know, unless Nick tells you it's his wallet. But when he's sending money to and from people, then they're going to change it so that has a certain layer of masking as well. And that's going to be able to help Nick have a lot more security functionality. Or not Nick, but the but the wallet that he has has a lot more security functionality. So again, guys, more governance, more overwatch. There's another big narrative out there. And they talk about how people could just misuse all the blockchain, right? They can program AI and then it becomes Skynet or it becomes like all those scary movies that you've been seeing. Well, I'm telling you that this is something that is real and people can go and they can validate it. It's something called AI Verify. And this is a big collaboration with multiple countries and multiple companies and multiple um, schools, universities all over the world. Some of the top tech, co tech companies, including IBM Red Hat and many, many more. And they're sitting there going, OK, we need to create a foundational layer. So when we're building out blockchain, and, and all these algorithms, the AI that's attached to it, there are certain things that you are not allowed to do. You are not allowed to destroy humanity. You are not allowed to manipulate or try to hijack humanity, guys. These are the ground rules being built into the algorithm. So what happens is if somebody tries to go and build a, um, an, you know, a, a programming code that will take it over or will corrupt something or will manipulate something, it's going to flag the system. So once the system is flagged, they'll know who you are. You're the naughty criminal. They'll send it straight to law enforcement and they'll come and arrest you. Again, guys, beauty of blockchain. You guys want to add anything to this point? Yeah, so that that there's, there will be generative, generative AI, which when they try to do that and try to hack in, not only will they flag it, but the, the computers will learn that that's a method that they're using to try to hack into it so that if somebody in the future tries it, then they'll be able to, you know, stop it immediately. It's going to learn all the tricks that people try to do to, to break into um, the system so that in the future, they won't have any ability whatsoever to even attempt to uh, to, to use it to, to uh, gain the system. So that's very big. It's it's, it's going to be learning the, the crooked ways of people that are trying to be criminals. Yeah, great point, Nick. So if you have, guys, if you have never heard of generative AI and ML before, all it really means is the computer is teaching itself to get smarter over time. So that's why all the inputs are very, um, very helpful for it. So again, guys, for all the reasons that I've already talked about, Nick's talked about above, you cannot have a CBDC that is actually weaponized against people because of all these security protocols built into the system to govern the system itself, right? So 
um, again, you know, what, oh, I do want to mention this. Nick's talked about this as well. Non-blockchain innovation can achieve the same speed or decrease the cost. Well, guys, what did, what did Susanna ask earlier? You know, if, if you have to go and exchange your money into another fiat, these are massive fees. And it's slow because it's going to go drive to the place, right, the exchange, wait in line while they count. And then they got to go and, you know, do their little thing and they bring it back to you. How much time of your life did you waste? Many, many, many hours. And how many fees did you pay on an arm and a leg? But on blockchain, it's instant. If I want to Venmo you or PayPal you, I just type in your name. I type in an amount. Boom, send it. It's done. That's exactly like how blockchain is going to be. But in the future, with biometrics, it'll be even easier because you could just, you know, use eye recognition or thumbprint recognition or something else. And they can they can send it that way. So it's going to get faster and faster over time. And again, fractions of a penny in terms of the cost. And the last one I want to mention, some silly people have been talking about if there's an EMP strike, what happens? Well, I just proved to you guys that because of Stellar, you can use it offline. So there you go. No more objections because we covered them all. <laughs> so I want to fly through the next couple of slides a little bit more quickly. Um, real estate is probably one of the big hot words or hot topics right now because tokenization, tokenizing real estate rather, now we're talking trillions of dollars worth of value that's coming into the blockchain. And that's going to give us so much liquidity. So I'm not going to read these slides. People can go in. Um, Susanna, I'll, I'll provide you a copy of the slides as well. You can post it if you want to. But I'm going to highlight okay. just some of the red stuff. Immediately proves ownership and funds. This is what Nick was hinting at in this section, guys. You have proof of, of identification. You have proof of ownership. When you put everything together on blockchain, it's instant verification. And with smart contracts, it's going to be as easy as online shopping. So literally, just like you going onto, let's say, Amazon, and you're scrolling through, figuring out what you want to buy, that will be like how you can go and buy real estate. And it could be you know, a, a, um, a building. It could be, I want to do like the city in terms of development or a country's development, I mean, you have so many options. So you're not stuck there going, well, if I want to buy into real estate and I join this REIT, then this REIT only has, you know, like, let's say it's a smaller REIT. They have like five options. If I pay into that, then it's the ones that they choose, not the ones that I choose. But here, because everything's coming into blockchain, you can literally choose if you want to invest into this apartment building or that apartment building. It's so specified. So... Um, again, you know, not going to read it all, but if you see here in red, these are some of the things that are going to be um, automated because of blockchain. So you can see how powerful this is going to be in the future. Now, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different articles and just kind of fly through these. One thing on this Inc. article is, uh, guys, I want you to see that when you see the five ways blockchain is used, the top one is talking about financing, but the rest are not, right? Asset management, project property management, registries, um, property development, construction. This is now management of the assets. So when you tokenize something, it's not just for money. It's for everything else that involves the money as well. So that's a really big deal. I'll come back to the logistics topic at the end. But like Nick said, it brings over massive amounts of liquidity because truly a big differentiator is you're now empowering people who traditionally may not have the money or the time to invest into a traditional asset. So, you know, if you're stock, if you're playing the stock game, we don't have the knowledge that Nick has, right? We don't have 30 years of Wall Street knowledge. So we would go to a financial advisor, pay a whole bunch of money for them to do it for us. Or if you're gonna invest into, let's say, real estate, well, now you're spending hundreds, thousands of hours learning about real estate before you dump your money in. But here again, guys, everything is already gonna be regulated on the system. And they're only going to show you stuff that is backed by proven assets. So you can go and just like that Amazon, you can scroll through your Amazon and go, oh, I want to do this stock and this um, this house and this apartment complex. Done, done, done. It's so fast. So it, guys, massive game changer. I'm like, now, can I just add one thing to that? You don't have to go back to this slide. You had on the slide fractional, fractionalization. And that's huge because in the past, most of the great deals were only offered to the rich people, and you're not part of that gang. The, the general populace doesn't have the ability to get involved in all their most lucrative uh, schemes. So if now, with fractionalization, if, if, they, if there's a building for sale for $10 billion, you obviously you used to not be able to participate, because unless you have $10 billion, uh, more than likely, you're not going to be able to participate in an investment like that. 
but now you'd be able to buy a fraction of that building for whatever amount you might be able to afford. And you actually have the ability to participate in the same type of deals that, that only the rich and the elites were able to do, which is what I mentioned in my slide of economic equality. That everybody will have all the same types of opportunities. It won't be reserved only for the rich people. That's and a that great point. Oh, go ahead, no, and I wanted to mention it, that it also applies, for example, a famous art by Van Gogh, I guess. You can fractionalize now that piece of art yeah. and so forth and so on. Go ahead, Emily. Absolutely, Susanna. Great point. Um, I, I want to hit that topic of diversified portfolio really quickly as well. So let's say, for instance, you are on a budget, which I think almost everybody is on a budget, especially after COVID. <laughs> um, but so let's say like if you got, you know, only $100 to invest into, a normal person will go, well, I can't buy a house with that. And I definitely can't buy, you know, bigger real estate properties with that. Can I buy stock with that? Well, maybe a couple of shares, but then once you buy that, you're kind of screwed. Your money is locked in and you really just have to wait for it to go up or down. And then, you know, if you cash out, you pay massive amounts of commissions. Or if you pay the penny stocks, then, well, you never know what's going to happen there, right? So it's very high risk. Um, but over here, you can diversify your portfolio. Nick mentioned that you can put in whatever sum you want. If you want to put just a penny into a whole bunch of stuff, you can. If you want to put a dollar into a hundred different items, you can, right? It's totally up to you. And that way, for most people, it really helps them become more at ease with the concept of, of um, investments because most of us don't have the knowledge to really do something, let's say, professionally. And so, you know, when we hear about diversifying our portfolio and how it mitigates a lot of risks, this is the perfect avenue for that. So this one I'm really laughing at because if you've been following the news, you would see that the, the Federal Reserve, you know, in America is like, we're not going to do CBDC. No way. No way. But yet they have a whole paper written on tokenization. So what does that mean? It means two things. America for sure is going to tokenize a CBDC, but the Federal Reserve is not going to. Because again, guys, the Federal Reserve, central bank, in America, it's totally defunct. But what's going to happen is the U.S. Treasury in the future is going to be the one that tokenizes it. So again, another hint, hint. And if you need more hints, please go watch the video that Nick and I did back in, I think it was October or November of 2020. November, November yeah. We'll put, that link. we'll put that link in the description so everybody okay. can go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Nick does a brilliant job going over like exactly how the IRS and the Federal Reserve are defunct, and actually the Treasury has taken over, and people don't even know. <laughs> so here's just a quick example. Osaka Digital Exchange, and they are, um, so they call it an incumbent because they're already a known exchange. They were founded by SBI. Um, they're backed by all these different banks and exchanges out there, right? So these are known players in the world. They're not some, some you know, uh, mom and pop shop. So that's really massive. There's another one they mentioned called the Six Exchange, and that's the one that's launched by um, you know Switzerland. So we we are starting to see this massive trend of not just small companies, mom and pops, startups trying to do this um, you know exchange marketplace, but tried and true big institutional uh, in institutions with massive you know decades of history with many other institutions backing them. They're all getting in this game, and that should tell you how big of a deal it is. Um, Proppy is a, is a company that I think several people have heard of before, but they're basically the first company in the whole world to tokenize real estate, a marketplace for it. So you can actually go and buy your home or sell your home on this online real estate uh, platform through the, the existence of NFTs. So I just think that's really great because it shows you that guys, this is not just theory, it's literally already in practice. Here's another example. There's a company called Wavy, and they're actually replacing real estate agents with AI. So again, guys, all part of automation, all part of making our lives easier and cutting down on commissions that we have to pay for a traditional real estate agent. Really big deal. Tokenize mortgages, right? So again, they are thinking of everything. How can I move everything onto blockchain? And that's literally what they're doing. So um, here's another example. You know, before I was talking more about more specifically retail, like, you know, buying a home or selling a home. But now Visa has partnered up with HSBC, which is the um, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, and Hang Seng Bank, which is out of Shang uh, China. 
And they are now showing you that even with high value real estate, this can still work. The reason why I'm singling this out, guys, is because I have, you know, people in my own family who work in real estate and they go, Emily, that's great. You know, you can do whatever you want to with your own money. You can buy a house with crypto if you want to. There's no, you know, regulation on that. But we work in real estate and we're dealing with hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth of transactions. And there's a lot of red tape. It'll never, ever fly for this, for major, major commercial deals. Well, clearly it has because it already did. <laughs> so, I mean, like it's, it's a no brainer, guys. Everything is coming in. Now, if we talk about, Nick, you want to say something real quick? Yeah. No, I just want to mention one thing because this is a big announcement and I even posted on the channel that I don't think people understand the magnitude of this. They're showing you that you can scale up blockchain to trillions, gazillions, bazillions of dollars easily. It's not even hard to do, but even the bigger issue is that they're tokenizing bank deposits. So when they do a transaction, you can they're tokenizing the deposit of the sale of a building, let's say. That's the precursor to having asset-backed digital currency because they'll have already tokenized deposits. Our monies are in the bank. So if they've done the process already, we're ready for asset-backed currency without having to develop the technology or the, the means to tokenize deposits. So this is a huge announcement, both from Emily's point of view of, no, it's not true. You can't scale it up because you... This is a perfect example of yes, you can. Not only that, but it's setting up and preparing for the future of what's coming by already putting together the methodology and the technology, tokenized bank deposits. So it's a very, very big deal. So yeah. tokenized, so I'm sorry, tokenized first, and then you we have our asset backed pegged or whatever it is, and then it has a value. And that's what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, they have the about. technology to yep. be able to hold the accounts and show right. you your money and all that stuff. That's, that's huge, huge. Yeah, and, and remember, guys, we mentioned that industry is leading regulation. So this is all happening before blockchain regulation comes out because they have to test and make sure it's flawless again before the masses come and join the network. So they're all doing things behind the scenes. And the fact that real estate that's high value can be done and it's approved shows you it's wink, wink, nudge, nudge that behind the scenes, the regulators are already watching and they're already saying, yep, if it works, great. Let's test it some more before we do regulation. Because if I scroll back up real quickly, how can you possibly have no regulation if you have all these other regulators who are already on board, right? So that should tell you that this is real and it's already done. So the because, legitimate regulators. Yeah, these are massive. These are some of the biggest players in the entire world. So if I go over to Abu Dhabi, um, the only thing I really want to highlight on this is two parts. So again, in the red. So this is a project that's being done by the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. And they're saying that all roles and all responsibilities related to real estate affairs will now be transferred onto the unified entity, right? So they're telling you this is going onto the ledger, onto the blockchain, where everything is unified. You don't have, you know, go to this company for this, this third party for this, this third party for that, because that's what you do now, right? You have insurance, you have title, you have loans, you have this and that. It's it's kind of a nightmare because you have that many commissions to pay. But here, consolidated, one single point of entry, minimize fees, and you're done. And so, you know, obviously consolidation, obviously governance is involved too, because now we're talking about the country's, um, not just like a, a city's governance, but the top, you know, the top dog. This is the, the crown prince of, of Abu Dhabi. But they're using that as a beta test because in time, more cities, more countries around the world will be adopting this exact model. Now, DocuSign, I think everybody knows DocuSign, right? This slide, I want to show you that they are, have already been working on something called proof of lifeness and generative AIML, both things that Nick also mentioned in his section earlier. So we talked about facial recognition. We talked about um, uh, fingerprint recognition as well. And so this is something that DocuSign has already been working with Microsoft, um, Microsoft Azure, uh, OpenAI. I think many people know about that platform already. But they have docu they sorry they have uh, partnerships with so many different kinds of companies. Another one is called ID Scan. So ID Scan is helping them with face and voice recognition as well to make sure that we have all these different layers of protection to make sure you are who you say you are, not just because you put somebody's you know selfie up 
in front of a camera and then pretending to be that person, right? But one of the things I thought was so hilarious about this, Susanna and Nick, is that when they say they're confirming, so I'm going to read a section right here. It says, detect spoofing, and spoofing means that they're going to confirm the signers are who they say they are at the physical present location at the time of signing, and the IDs are valid. But then when you actually look at the article, the article only mentions ID scanned as face and voice. So that means they can confirm the signers and they can confirm the IDs, but they never mention who is actually doing the KYC for the physical presence. Guys, that's because these are the sneaky ninjas behind the scene. Remember the governance on top of the governance we talked about? They're the ones who are tapping into law enforcement going, aha, okay, now we need to make sure that we have everything combined so that you don't have somebody again who stole your selfie and they're not trying to pretend to be you or with the advent of deep fakes these days, we don't want someone to record your voice and go, oh, we have your picture, we have your voice. That's definitely Nick Ragon, but you know, meanwhile, it's not. But they are not you because they are not physically present where you are. And that, guys, is the game changer here. This bottom section talks about generative AI ML, and they're actually using this to look. It says integration for human readable contractual terms. What does that mean? It means that as this AI is scanning for the contracts, they're looking at all the different legalese and saying, what does that mean so that the average person can study this and learn it without having to go to law school, right? Nick mentioned that. They, all these specialists that you pay ob gobs of money for, for their fee, you don't need to pay for their services because the AI is doing it for you. So again, guys, it's a beautiful system, just saving us so much money on the background. And so, much peace and, and peace of mind, may I say. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so I have two more slides on um, on basically law enforcement because I want to really dr drill into everybody's heads that CBDC truly is quantum security. So the first example is over in Australia, they're beta testing this right now. They're calling for, you know, anti-money anti -money laundering laws because they're expanding into real estate, right? Real estate, lawyers, accountants. Why is that? Because they know that this is usually where you hide the fraud, right? You have funny money in your accountants. And because you already have funny money, now you need to have a funny lawyer to know that if somebody tries to sue you, your funny lawyer will protect you. And then where do you hide it? Oftentimes in real estate. So now they're saying, nope, not on my watch. We're going to go put our governance system into all three sectors. And we're now going to watch. And if you click into the article, it actually talks about the global dirty money watch list. Now, guys, in my you know life up until now with blockchain, I've never heard of countries working with other countries, especially law enforcement, and they are merging their databases together. Usually it's, no, you're your country, I am my country, let's not work together because I don't want you stealing my information, right? It's a security issue. But now they're saying, Whoa, it's the global watch list. That means the whole world is working in unison to catch all the crooks. And here's another one, US Treasury target scammer. So guys, not just in Australia, but here in America, we're also doing this and we're also targeting real estate money laundering. And again, guys, they mentioned, and this is in the US Treasury information itself. I posted the link here to the actual article, uh, the document, law enforcement's new informational database, right? So they're doing the new database and they're finalizing moves to clamp down on money laundering by 2025, 2026. So they're already through the process. They're already, you know, they, they put the, the programming in place. They're doing the beta testing right now. And they're looking to finalize catching the criminals within only the next two years. So this is very, very fast. Because if you know, you know, law enforcement, Law enforcement usually takes years, if not decades, to get anywhere, and oftentimes they go nowhere at all. <laughs> so to have global governance in two years is tremendous. It is. Can, can I put a? Let me let me just piggyback on you because you're mentioning U.S. Treasury target scammers. We're talking about real estate. Well, guess what happened today? You find it on Yahoo. It's on the news. U.S. hits Mexican accountants and firms with sanctions for timeshare scams that support drug cartel <laughs> right so on the criminals, the criminals are trying to catch criminals that's how you know things are changing 
That's how you know are not really in control anymore. <laughs> so I want to move on to logistics and the next two sections are going to be pretty short. Um, but I want to show you guys, right? Remember before, if I just go back up to this one, right? Five ways blockchains are being used. And I mentioned out of the five, four of them are not financial. So logistics, obviously a massive piece of the puzzle. And this is how you catch the criminals. Because again, if you're tokenizing everything, everything means everything. It means supply chain. It means logistics. It means inventory. It means, you know, warehouse. I mean, everything. And so here they are saying that it's going to improve the registration, transparency, traceability, reliability. You know, everything is coming into blockchain. But how are they doing that? Again, I'm not going to read all the words, but if you focus on oversight and automation, that's your answer right there. Because the oversight, again, are these, these entities coming in saying, hey, doesn't matter if you're a government, a country, a company, whatever. We're here to make sure that if you are a criminal, we're going to catch you. And then through automation, it's going to say, we don't even need to have and hire eyeballs to watch. We can program AIML that is generative and intuitive and get smarter over time. And they're going to scan all of these transactions happening and they'll be able to do it billions, trillion times faster than eyeballs watching the screen. So that means when you catch a criminal, it becomes faster and faster over time. And when they spend it over to law enforcement, they, through their automation, also becomes faster over time too. So really, all it really does is it optimizes the traceability, the operations, the inventory, record keeping, financing, compliance, sustainability. So this is why Nick and I have repeatedly said, this brings you transparency. It brings you security because nobody can tamper with this kind of stuff. Yeah, no. not only that, not only that, in manufacturing, one of the biggest issues is when you, the bill, of, the, the bill of lading, lading bills, they get lost. They take yeah. forever. And many times, many times your, your, your merchandise sits there for no reason. So actually it works both ways and it's beautiful. Yeah. And you can't, you can't bribe AI and pay it under the table to try to slip something into the country and stuff like that. So you can't bribe a computer. That's, yeah. that's a uh, big positive. Huge positive. <laughs> so Chainyard is a company and they've already been doing massive work behind the scenes. This is an article on, on the top uh, left corner, an article from 2019. And they've been working with, you know, major companies like IBM. Um, and here, if you see like Telecom Pharma Beverage. So if you, if you zoom into it, Anheuser-Busch, Cisco, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, Lenovo, Nokia, um, Schneider Electric, Vodafone, right? These are major companies all over the world. And they've already been doing a lot of this beta testing in the background to ensure that tokenizing logistics and um, and uh, logistics and supply chain can and be done. So normally when we talk about crypto, it's called KYC, know your customer. But here it's called TYS, trust your supplier for the reasons like what Susanna was mentioning, Bill of Laden, we don't want to work with suppliers who are very shady and they're going to do something funny with our inventory in the background. We want to make sure everything is transparent and we always know exactly where our inventory or where it's being sourced is coming from. So when I finish this section and show you how even John Deere themselves is doing this right now. Now, I don't have the video, but I can send you the link for the YouTube video. <clears throat> but there are three small itty-bitty sections I want to highlight. So the first one is, these are the minutes on the actual video. But the top one is the machine is learning how to teach itself and get smarter over time. That's what Nick was referring to when he said generative AI. So in this left-hand um, snapshot, these are guys who are writing this automated tr uh, tractor. So they're not driving it, right? The tractor is driving itself. And when they were doing the initial testing for it, it was a clear day. So it runs great. But in this example, you can kind of see it's a little um, hazy. It's because there are huge wind gusts. So the wind gust was kicking up all these rocks and it was stopping the tractor. So this guy in black is explaining to the guy in the green shirt saying, hey, this machine is learning it. It's collecting all the data. So we can go and we can actually perfect the AIML programming later on and come back and test out the new and improved version, right? So that's why it's getting smarter over time. Right now, they're still having to manually code it. But in the future, the machine will code itself. This middle section that you see here is literally talking about supply chain. It says, um, if we're doing like cotton, a bale of cotton, 
or a bale of hay, as an example, as they are, um, you know, collecting all the top of the cotton and putting it into this, um, you know, bale like shape, they can actually tag it at the same time. So when let's say you are fruit of loom and you got your new undies, you'll know that your undie was made from this cotton from this field in this location. And it's not child labor laws. It's, you know, nothing funny going on in the background. It's because again, guys, it's all traceable. And then over here, this is um, basically a snapshot of this other, um, I don't know if it's called a, a tractor or not. It's some kind of uh, contraption. And they're basically spraying weed repellent um, sprays. And because of what's called LIDAR, which is a sensor, the sensor can tell when there's a weed and it sprays it versus when there's no weed so the sensor does not go off, so it doesn't need to spray. So you can see how this alone, because everything's automated, it saves the farmers time and money, right? They don't have to go and do the spraying. That machine can do it. And they don't have to physically monitor for where all the weeds are. The machine is doing it. So pretty amazing stuff here. So I want to go and finish on this last section, other real world assets. Um, I just have a handful of slides, guys. So the first one is, um, fan tokens, right? So um, even sports teams are looking at having tokens because they know that this is how they can really start to add more liquidity into their own ecosystem too. Because if you do this, then just like what, you know, Susanna, you were talking about this with the movie earlier, you can have certain rights, you know, like as, as a fan, if you love whatever this sports team is, which is, you know, tens or, or hundreds of millions of people around the world, then they can go and buy a fan token and perhaps get special access to sporting events or goods, you know, like early releases for let's say new jerseys or new swag or something. And so they can have all the stuff built into them, which brings in new liquidity, but then they also have a secondary component where it says in some kinds of tokens, it will actually give you the fan governance and you can actually show your voice by voting on certain things, right? So it's kind of turning the, the tables around and going, hey, if you want to become you know, a super fan, let's give you way more access and allow you to be part of the decision-making process. This is actually what you're referring to a second ago. So we talked about sports and now here comes movies and music. So they're tokenizing all of this stuff because they know that you know, in the past, um, we have all these third-party players, right? So in the banking, the financial industry, Nick's talked about you know, banks and other kind of payment platforms where it's just commission after commission after commission. Well, it's no different for sports, movies, and music, right? The entertainment world, they have agents. They have, you know, I want to go to this theater. I'm going to pay them for this kind of copyrights. And I mean, it's a nightmare with a lot of money. But here, you have control of your own asset. Or you can also buy a small controlling share of somebody else's project. And so if it's your project, you get, part, you get that royalty without having to go through all the lawyers. So again, guys, really amazing stuff coming down the pipeline. And the last slide I want to end on is a fun one. Securities and tax law exemption. Now, if you have been following Lights of the Round Table and QSI, you'll know why Susanna and Nick are smirking right now. If we look at the top article here, it's, it says, House Committee Talks Tokenizing Stake, Egg Securities, and Other Real World Assets. And this top over here, anything in the real world can be tracked on blockchain, which is great because they're having, well, they just had about a month and a half ago, a House Financial Services Committee hearing on real world assets and how they facilitate efficient markets. And in the article, it talks about how with smart contracts, which again, is how you make everything automated. So smart contracts automation makes supply chains more efficient. It brings real-time transparency, it lowers the cost, and increases market penetration, which just means more liquidity, more people joining the ecosystem. And then that article ends with this right here. It says, American University Law Professor says himself, if you slap a blockchain on any kind of investment contract, it becomes magically exempt from security laws. Guys, so this is a law professor telling you that if you tokenize and you put it on the blockchain, you get to skirt security law. Well, guys, that's the reason why the SEC has basically been neutered. We've been seeing that month after month, case after case, they basically have no balls, no grounds to 
to stand on right now. If we talk about this article down here, this is actually the IRS website itself. And it says, in January of 2024, so just a couple of months ago, announcement 2024-4 um, section you know, 60501 or I or something, it says digital assets are not required to be included in IRS reporting. Guys, this is massive because if you are brand new to blockchain, you're thinking, oh, well, I only do not have to report my taxes if I have digital assets. But if I don't invest, I still have to abide by traditional IRS rules. And what we're telling you, this entire video, this entire call is no, no. By the law, by the IRS themselves, we have already shown you a little bit on this call, but a lot of it on a lot of other calls that we've done in the past, that your money, right? Your money that's sitting in your bank account right now, guys, you might not know, but we know, and we've shown you the proof, it's already been tokenized on the Stellar blockchain. That means every single transaction that you've made since January of this year does not have to be reported by IRS's own tax laws. But then if you backdate that to two years ago, you know, Nick again already showed that the IRS is defunct. It's already been absorbed by the Treasury. So theoretically, no matter how you look at it, whether it's through the IRS's own words or the fact that the IRS is really non-existent, you don't have to pay taxes this year because you have proof. And if they try to fight you, you can slam their own law in their own face. So that's all I've got, guys. You guys have any comments? Yeah, I want to add, I want to add to this. There's two important points on this. <clears throat> in terms of the, um, this is a precursor to no more taxes, okay? They're saying no taxes on digital assets, right? So if everything is digital assets, no more taxes. That's it. Simple enough, right? So yeah. this is a precursor to this era, the in implementation of no more income taxes, no more sales tax, no more mortgage tax. All taxes will be gone based on that one law, okay? The second thing I wanted to mention was that there was an a, a article recently, and you know this, Emily, as well, and, and Susanna as well, that the banks said, in terms of the safety of your monies in the banks, that uh, there's risk basically to all of your assets except your cryptocurrency assets that basically the bank is supposedly holding for you, right? So they're saying that everything else, you know, you're going to get a limited guarantee from the FDIC, which is worthless, basically. But they're saying that if so, if an institution goes at risk of insolvency or goes under, all of the other assets are at risk except the cryptocurrency portion that's that's basically held by the bank. And the banks are, are, are working on getting tokenized deposits and all that. Now, why is that the case? Well, we use Lobster, right? So we look at our wallet, and to the to the novice, they think that lobster is holding the assets. They think that the, they think it's a custodial wallet, meaning that it's actually in lobster itself. It's not anywhere else. It's in lobster. It's being held by lobster. But actually, lobster is a non-custodial wallet, meaning it's just a viewer for you to see what you have in the blockchain, right? So the banks are not going to be holding your money. It's going to be on the blockchain. It's going to you'll see an account and you'll see a deposit thing. But there's no money in the bank there, so that's why it's not at risk. It's not part of the bank's assets. It's totally separate. So if you dig a little deep into what, what, what they're doing here, they're setting everything up for what we talked about, a totally digitized world, no income taxes, the SARA coming into place, and, uh, and, and the IRS is gone uh, because you won't need it because digitizing digitized assets are not reportable. Everything will be digital. So. <laughs> Well, thanks. thanks, Emily, for re for sharing that article that just came out, I think, last week, which is very exciting. This also means that uh, as a precursor, that means that we are not going to have an inflationary uh, economy anymore. Uh, everything is going, you know, pop the balloon off, you know. Inflation is have... a, it's a, it's a, it's a mirage. It's not real. It's basically just them tacking on a couple of percent every single year. Just to take, make, charge more money, take more money. It's all fictitious. It's it's not it's not a real thing. People don't yeah. know that. 
Yeah, but imagine now, now everybody, since everybody's collaborating on this blockchain, everything has to be decentralized. Imagine on our world, uh, what effect it has on our worldwide economies around, you know, it's just going to be fantastic. Yeah, and you don't no, have devaluation, totally. inflation should be valuing money. Money becomes worth less because they're printing gobs and gobs of it, right? They're not going to be printing money anymore. So there's not going to be a central organization controlling the money supply and making your dollar worth less and less and less. Since the Federal Reserve has come into place in 1913, the dollar has lost 97% of its value. Think about that. It's almost gone to zero since the Federal Reserve has come into place and put into existence. That's why they got to go. Yeah, I mean, and, and to piggyback off of what you guys are saying, all it really says is most people are thinking of blockchain in terms of, oh, it's solving all these real world problems, right? It's the hero coming in and saving the day. But what it's actually doing is it's both. It's kind of like martial arts where you attack and you defend at the same time. So not only are they putting a new system in place and saying this is the better version and here's all the reasons why it's better, but it's also highlighting here's where all the corruption is. I've got it all listed because these are all the things that we're debunking. These are all the things that went wrong. And that's the whole reason why we need to have a new system to begin with. So it serves a great dual purpose for that. Um, which will be great in terms of helping people wake up and understand that, guys, this is the corrupt system we've all been living under for many, many decades now. So, yeah, I just, I just love when you have fact after fact, proof after proof of just um, everything is corrupt. It's not just verbal. It's not some conspiracy theory, but the governments know it. The companies know it. Everybody knows it. And now they're all being forced to work together to solve it. Yeah, and the main thing is that there's transparency so we as people can look at everything, everything they do. There's no hiding money or passing things that we don't know about or voting dead people, dead people. We can see everything as us. Now we can't look at the voter rolls and, you know, uh, how many people voted for Trump and Biden and the states and the breakdowns and all. But in the future, we'll be able to do that. So we'll be able to see that it was legit. They can't hide anything. So if you can't hide anything, that's it. You're done as a criminal. Right. So Emily, um, the, for all those who are new and they're listening to um, tokenizations and CBDCs for the first time, um, they're going to say, well, when is this going to happen? How soon are we going to be noticing this? When can we actually purchase things i know that some some uh retail stores are accepting some crypto currencies but it's not in the it's not mainstream yet so what is your answer to something like that oh that's a great question susanna and i i have to help people understand that everything they're doing again guys this is uh it's already live in the system you might not be able to use let's say your non-CBDCs to purchase, but your CBDCs lifetime today, actually as of um, probably, you know, a, a year plus ago, have already been used for transactions. And one great example, um, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned going to Japan and doing that. Well, I also just recently went to the grocery store and I totally forgot that my phone was on airplane mode because I always have my phone on airplane mode, no matter where I am. So, you know, I drove to the grocery store and I paid again using my Coinbase debit card and I tapped just as normal and the process went through. And then afterwards, I was like, oh, I need to use my GPS. Oh, it's actually on airplane mode. So again, guys, proof that, you know, whether it was Japan or here in America, that tap to pay function offline still went through means it's already on the Stellar blockchain. So we're already using the Stellar blockchain live today, even if you don't know it. Now, if you're referring more to other kinds of assets, right, the non-CBDC assets, it's a kind of a tricky question because if you're buying into, let's say, non-stellar blockchain assets, there may or may not be more or less liquidity, right? Something like a, a Bitcoin and Ethereum, you can buy and sell that all the time. You can you know, do your, your day trading on that if you want to. But something like in the stellar blockchain has virtually zero liquidity right now. So this very much is a game of buy and hold. This is very much as of today, a game of do your research, make sure you know what you're investing into because we're expecting to hold at least three to five years before we start to see some you know, nice returns on it. And so I want people to know that Stellar Blockchain is not where you go if you are a day trader. This is for the people who are more long-term thinkers 
and they want to help to grow the ecosystem because as you grow the ecosystem, well, just like with any company, if you join a company and then they're in the garage phase, startup phase, garage phase, and you buy them before they ICO or the IPO rather, you're going to make a huge profit. That's where we are. That's the current stage of the seller ecosystem right now. Nick, I'm sure you have a, a word or two for that. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think what we're seeing now, and this is what you talk about all the time, we're seeing bridges, meaning we're seeing we're seeing ways of communicating between different types of payment systems and uh, and uh, currencies and cryptocurrencies and all that. Whereas the Visa is a perfect example, where Visa was not able to send tokenized the money over to the bank until they created this test that obviously worked. So they created a, a, a pipeline between Visa and the banks. And they're doing that, whereas you'll be able to do that with all different types of payment systems, Venmo and PayPal and whatever else, that you'll be able to communicate with your cryptocurrency wallets with those, you utilizing them together in order to pay for pay for stuff in the future. So all that's being built out now uh, as, as we speak. The other thing is that you're not going to be able to basically use any token whatsoever to go to the store and buy. And buy. You know, you, 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 to use physical assets, you can't bring your cow to the store and then use your cow to pay for, you know, your eggs and your milk and your vegetables. That's it. So you're not going to be able to convert, like, anything, any token. It's going to be currency designated tokens that are considered to be currency or money or utilized to purchase stuff. There'll be multiple ones, but it's not going to be like every token that you own will be able to be used you can convert it from what you have to a currency token and then do so you're going to have a designated uh, amount of tokens that'll be considered to be able to be used for transactions and sending money and all that stuff i mean that just makes common sense because companies and stuff can't accept you know five thousand different tokens it would just be it would just be um, non-productive so I want, to, I want to piggyback onto that because that's actually a really good point to make. And I think it's a, a point of clarification for people who may be, let's say, confused if they're brand new in the system. So if we go back to Bridges, what Nick was talking about a second ago, this is really important because, Susanna, your question was about if people are aware of what they're using and what's the timeline that they're using at. And uh, my response was that we're already using it, right? So if you kind of put the, we are already using it, plus Nick talked about bridges together, then it's showing you that whatever you're doing right now, you're already using crypto, even if you don't even know you're using it. That's an important factor because many people are not using crypto or they're not, let's say, investing into crypto because they don't know what's going on. It's very complicated to learn or they think it's complicated to learn, so they're staying away. But what the industry is doing is they're saying, hey, we're actually going to go and we're going to make it so easy that even without you knowing, you're already into the ecosystem. Now, if I add on to what Nick was saying a second ago, because of these bridges, right? So Nick talked about how you're not going to have a, let's say, a vendor who is going to want to be able to open up their wallets and accept 5,000 different kinds of coins. But what I will say is you as the, let's say, the payer, the payee, sorry, Pay. the payer, the payer, you can send whatever token you want to. Mm. And the payee, the person accepting, can accept it in whatever they want to as well. So here's an example. Let's say I have um, ABC token and Nick's like, I don't want ABC, I want XYZ. And I'm like, well, I don't have XYZ, what do I do? Well, what I can do is I can still send out my ABC token. It goes through a bridge, Susanna, you're gonna be our bridge, you're gonna be our blockchain bridge. It does all the swapping in the background that I don't know about, but it's instant. And after I send it through you with a touch of a button, it receives on Nick's side, as XYZ token, he didn't have to change anything. I didn't have to change anything. But Susanna, you're our automation. You're our bridge. It's automated because of AI ML, and it's doing everything for us, and it's near instant. And yeah, that's, that's a good point. So that's what I was saying. You need to swap it for, but it'll be done automatically. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be implemented worldwide. So that's yeah. huge as well. It is huge. And I think that what is, um, so there's going to be, uh, the platforms will be able to communicate into reportability and then eventually um, things will go into the one blockchain eventually a few years from now. 
next week. I happen to have uh, one of those CBDC projects that have been working on it worldwide in, in another country, and they'll be explaining to us how that project is, how it started in that country, where is it going, and where is it going to in the in the in the uh, in the future, and that's going to be quite exciting because I think that will put to rest again what CBDCs are and what they are not, and this is coming from another country that actually is testing, already has been beta testing CBDCs for some time. And this is really, really just to, um, I think the idea was to bring the unbanked and the underbanked into uh, being able to have that inclusion in finance. So it's gonna be quite exciting. And um, anyways, I really thank you both for being here again. Proof after proof, it's easy and it's unrefutable. That's all I can say. So if anybody wants to learn more about this whole blockchain construction that is happening um, and you know, break through the noise because we broke through the noise. We were as curious, we were as, um, at one point we were as worried as anybody else. We couldn't sleep. We were wondering what was gonna happen with our finances. We were wondering what was gonna go on if we were gonna lose electricity because of the grid. None of that is gonna happen. We found out through the research and thank you for Emily who actually put all those dots together. We realized that there is a financial brewing, a, a new financial system brewing just below in a hush hush way. So all the noise is just noise. And what's going to happen is a beautiful renaissance coming to be, and it's beautiful. So for those who want to be ahead of the curve, I encourage you to take a peek at the Quantum Solar Initiative community. Wonderful for not just the finances, but it goes into your own um, spiritual and personal growth as well. So thank you very much for both. And um, I hope to see you again on a second mini series of proofs. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for having us. Thank you, Suzanne. You're welcome.